The title of today's webinar is The Impact of the Economic Crisis Caused by COVID-19 on Poverty and Inequality. You're still learning about the massive economic crisis generated by COVID-19. And one of the most pressing policy concerns is the implication of COVID-19 on poverty and inequality in the global south. The reasons expect that within country inequality has increased. As the most vulnerable workers, especially in informal employment, have been badly affected by the pandemic and government lockdown policies. It is less clear what might have happened to across country inequality. It may also increase as East Asia starts recovering faster than other developing regions. It's also the case that richer countries have shown some of the sharpest income decline. However, much of the discussion that we have had on COVID's impact on inequality has been speculative. And the evidence base and the implication of the pandemic on inequality remains weak uh, as of today. So in today's webinar, we're privileged to have one of the leading thinkers on global inequality assess the likely impacts of the pandemic on national and global inequality. We're also fortunate to have a distinguished discussant for the policy world to share insights on the policy implications of impact of COVID-19 on inequality and what the international development community can do in this respect. Now, let me introduce the speaker and the discussant. Speaker is Professor Fancer Burginon, who's the Emeritus Professor of Economics at the Paris School of Economics. He was the director of the Paris School of Economics from 2007 to 2013. Before that, he was chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank. Francois is one of the seminal thinkers in development economics, has made many important contributions on research and poverty and inequality. He also has a long association with WIDER. He was a member of WIDER's advisory board from 2001 to 2008. So it's a pleasure to invite Francois back to our WIDER event. Now let me introduce our uh, discussant, Matua Roig. Matua Roig is the chief of the emerging issues and trends section at the Division of Inclusive Social Development of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Marta has over 20 years of experience conducting policy research and analysis linked to inequality, employment, international migration, and the linkages to development. So it's a pleasure also to have Marta here as a discussant. Now, I'd like to invite Francois to present his keynote. Francois, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kunal. Uh, thank you very much to, to Wider and uh, to you for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. I should say, I would say normally it's a pleasure to be back to Wider, and uh, uh, I'm really simply sorry that uh, I am uh, uh, on uh, my chair in my apartment in Paris rather than uh, in, uh, in a conference room in, uh, in Helsinki. But uh, this is uh, our life is these days. Uh, okay, so uh, the topic for this uh, presentation is uh, about uh, COVID-19 and uh, um, the uh, impact of that uh, crisis we are going through for the last uh, 12 months on, uh, uh, on inequality and the way in which uh, this uh, crisis may have uh, uh, increased or exacerbated uh, existing inequalities or created new inequalities. Now, uh, this uh, presentation has been uh, entitled Some First Reflections. First, basically, because it is certainly too early to say very much uh, on uh, the impact of the crisis on inequality. Uh, we, we lack the data necessary to make uh, any uh, precise study of uh, that impact. And uh, um, hopefully, uh, in uh, the coming uh, year, we will have more information information and it will be possible to get to more definitive conclusions about uh, this, uh, this issue. Uh, on the other hand, instead of referring to a specific topic like global inequality or uh, poverty, uh, I entitled this presentation some reflections basically because I would like to look at various uh, dimensions of inequality. Inequality is not uh, only income inequality, it is not only consumption or wealth inequality, it is not only inequality in front of health or in front of, of the death, uh, in front of, uh, of a pandemic. It is all this at the same time. And uh, uh, I simply wanted to give, to look at those various dimensions 
sequentially uh, in order to, to get a full picture of uh, the relationship between the crisis and, uh, and, and, and inequality. So let me uh, move on with uh, uh, the presentation. So uh, COVID-19 has been presented very often these days as both uh, showcasing and exacerbating uh, inequality for various reasons. First, it is expected to hit harder people who are living in precarious conditions. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that the policy uh, measures may have uh, dampened this effect. Second, the lockdown uh, is likely to have affected more low-income people with unregular jobs, very often informal workers, especially in the South, but also in the North. Uh, and uh, this is contributing uh, necessarily to inequality. At the global level, the global economic crisis, which has been the consequence of uh, the pandemic, has increased global poverty without any doubt. And presumably, but we'll see that a little later, may have contributed to more global inequality. And uh, uh, finally, the human capital loss in low-income countries among precarious households, like uh, the effect of uh, poverty, the effect of unemployment, the uh, interruption in schooling will affect future inequality. And this is something that uh, uh, we would like to also to take into account. So too early to estimate all these effects, but one can speculate about what, what they could be. And in particular, I think it is important to uh, make clear the various dimensions we want to look at, uh, uh, through which we want to look at the inequality. And I must say that uh, I could not resist uh, making this a critique to the last uh, report by Oxfam on uh, the virus and, uh, and inequality, uh, because it is um, typical, despite the fact that this uh, report is uh, providing very interesting information on uh, uh, inequality and, uh, the, uh, and the pandemic, uh, it relies on the very argument, which I, be, which I find very specious, which is basically to say, look, a lot of inequality because the 10 largest uh, billionaires have been able to recover their fortune in nine months when it will take a few years for people to uh, recover their initial level of income. But of course, there is a complete confusion here between uh, the uh, price on stock markets and the fact that uh, the uh, day, the uh, month the pandemic uh, uh, struck uh, stock markets uh, crashed in more or less everywhere in the world, and then they went back to some level in some countries uh, at the initial level, in some other countries are not yet there. So this is a complete confusion. It has nothing to do with the standard of living of the people, with the consumption expenditure of the people. So uh, we should be really careful in when looking at inequality issues to make sure that we're talking about something which is well-defined and uh, to have rigorous arguments. So my presentation will be about this. Very quickly on each of these issues, inequality of casualties, what we can say, how unequal is the cost of the lockdown uh, uh, and the impact of compensating policies, what happened at the global level with global inequality, and finally, a few remarks on the likely legacy effects of the lockdown and the possible reversal in the downward global inequality trend that was observed over the last 20 years or so. On the inequality of casualties, across countries, the case is extremely clear. You have here a map of the incidence of the pandemic. We know that it is very often, very likely uh, uh, underestimated in uh, many low-income countries, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. But even if it were consistently estimated, it is, uh, there is no doubt that the crisis has struck much more uh, severely uh, advanced countries than uh, developing countries in general. So from that point of view, there is definitely uh, not an increase in inequality in the, uh, the world and on, on the contrary. So uh, this is, uh, uh, one uh, aspect which uh, needs to be uh, to be uh, emphasized. Now, it is not clear that uh, we cannot say anything about the future. I mean, there is a view already today saying that the 
pandemic is starting to hit uh, seriously uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which has been more or less uh, uh, isolated, which had not, not been too much hit until, until now. Within country, uh, we have uh, something which is uh, uh, quite different in the sense that uh, we have little information on the socioeconomic status of the COVID victims, but what we can do is the same kind of geographical correlation. And if we look at the incidence of the pandemic uh, in, uh, in a country or in a city, we can uh, try to look at the correlation between the socioeconomic status of areas uh, in uh, uh, or sub districts in uh, uh, in a urban area, and to see whether there is correlation. On this picture here, what you have is the incidence of the pandemic, which are the red uh, circles, uh, and uh, uh, the color of the various uh, sub districts, sub ward units in uh, uh, London area in uh, UK, uh, which are dark for low socioeconomic status, as uh, uh, described by the a proportion of uh, so-called unsecure occupations, temporary contracts, interior jobs, self-employed people, or we would, we would find exactly the same kind of correlation with poverty of children. And you see that there is a clear correlation. The virus hit much more strongly those parts of the London area with a low socioeconomic status. Priori, the same analysis could be done at uh, the uh, global level but uh, as we have seen, it would give exactly the opposite result, although some people do not completely agree with this uh, statement. Now, the previous correlation must be taken with care because uh, uh, we have to take into account what was the initial level of uh, mortality uh, and to see whether the virus increased uh, mortality in a disproportionate way in some areas or for some socioeconomic groups than for others. And uh, this study by a uh, Belgian economist, uh, De Coster and colleagues, uh, is showing that things are definitely not that easy, uh, not that simple. On this chart, what you have at the top is the excess mortality, therefore presumably due to the uh, pandemic, uh, for uh, men and then women on the right, uh, 65 and more. And this is by decile of the uh, income of those people, 65 and more, in Belgium. Many of them, of course, will be retired people, but then it will be uh, decile in terms of the pension that they receive. Uh, and this gives an idea about the socioeconomic uh, uh, group they were belonging to at the time they were active. And what you see here on the top is that you have a declining. Uh, 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 trend, not trend. You have a declining uh, shape, and the uh, meaning that uh, uh, rich people or rich socioeconomic status are less affected by the COVID than poor one. And from that point of view, you could say, "Oh, this is inequality." But if you look at the bottom uh, chart, the P score is defined as the excess mortality by the existing mortality as observed in previous years. Uh, as observed before 2020. And what you see is that the downward slooping uh, uh, shape that is uh, uh, on the top uh, graph is disappearing. It is now becoming something more or less horizontal, which means that mortality due to the pandemic is more or less proportional to the mortality of people 65 and more uh, uh, that uh, we observe regularly. So, depending on whether we want to look at inequality as related to health uh, uh, and the correlation between uh, uh, casualties and income uh, in uh, absolute terms or in relative terms, we will conclude that COVID uh, has increased or has maintained uh, inequality or has maintained the level of inequality where, where it was. So this example is important because it shows that things, conclusions are not that uh, uh, easy uh, to, to, to make. The uh, next topic, topic I want to look at is uh, how unequal the cost of the lockdown uh, has been and what has been the impact of compensating policies in, uh, in the countries. 
Now, the lockdown policies have been applied universally in uh, advanced as much as in uh, developing countries. Coupled with still working where it was possible with uh, partial employment compensation, uh, uh, then it uh, uh, was uh, uh, maybe uh, compensating, compensated in terms of uh, all the form formal employees who are not so much affected by this lockdown. And this lockdown was really affecting, as I said before, much more the informal workers uh, who could not uh, 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 leave their uh, area, their, their residence area, in order to go to work uh, uh, elsewhere in the city, or basically uh, where the, the demand for the services simply had stopped. So in all countries, and again, this is also true, but because the informal sector is less important in advanced countries, it is still more true in developing countries, uh, informal sector has been badly affected. And because of that, we may expect that indeed there was an increase in uh, inequality because we know that in that sector, uh, uh, the uh, income are lower. Now, in addition, we could say that those uh, sectors have been more affected directly by the, by the pandemic. Now, we know that in many countries, some partial compensation was provided through ad hoc public cash transfer programs. And uh, uh, this may have compensated or at least partly compensated the direct impact of the economic crisis due to the lockdown uh, and the, 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 the pandemic. So as I said, it's too early to estimate the impact of the crisis, but with some micro simulation uh, uh, exercises and uh, some uh, very limited surveys, we may try to say something about this impact. On this chart here, you have a very simple proxy for the impact uh, of the lockdown on inequality. This is taken from a study by Richard Blundell and the colleagues at uh, IFS. And uh, basically what uh, they did, they looked at what they call the shutdown sectors, the sectors which were most affected by the shutdown, uh, where inactivity went down because of the shutdown. And they looked at the deciles, this is what you have in the bottom left decile uh, uh, graph. They look at the decile uh, uh, to which uh, uh, people uh, working in those shutdown sectors belonged. Uh, and uh, uh, what you can see on this chart is that you have much less people uh, belonging to the top decides working in those shutdown sectors and presumably affected by the shutdown then you have uh, low income people, people in the first decide uh, uh, working in those uh, uh, shutdown sectors. So because of that, we may expect that the day we will have the data and uh, this will come soon because uh, in a country like uh, the UK or uh, other advanced countries, uh, you have labor force surveys which are taken more or less uh, every quarter. So we should uh, very soon start having to have some information on this. But this is a, a proxy or a sign that uh, inequality may have uh, increased because of that. You also have some people who did some micro simulation. So they look at uh, a sample of uh, households before the crisis, pre-pandemic, and they try to figure out what could be the change in the distribution of income in that population due to the pandemic, based on GDP uh, forecasts, based on information on unemployment and employment. They did what is called now casting. Basically, they have some partial information about changes which have taken place in the population, in particular in terms of employment. And they, they try to apply to the micro data uh, those changes which were uh, uh, observed or estimated at the, uh, uh, at the aggregate level. And uh, uh, most of these studies found that the lockdown led to a strong increase in income inequality, but it was almost completely compensated by cash transfer policies in advanced countries. And not only advanced countries, even in some emerging countries, as I will uh, show. Now, the term dimension is important because uh, we should look at what is going on within the year rather than the full year, which is the standard uh, time dimension of uh, all these analyses, but uh, I'm not uh, insisting uh, on this. 
On the other hand, it is clear that uh, these uh, estimations are very imprecise, but they give some order of magnitude and they tell us something about what may have happened. The following charts are taken from a study on Latin America by Nora Lustig. And the uh, things is they are quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. The solid line represents the direct impact, a uh, simulated impact of the lockdown on uh, the distribution. So this comes percentile by percentile. So we see if we look at Argentina, for example, that the uh, top percentiles have been less affected by the lockdown than the bottom percentiles. This is what we're expecting when we know that uh, the informal sector was more affected. And the dotted line would uh, correspond to uh, the uh, impact uh, of uh, the uh, crisis of the lockdown after compensation through the uh, transfer policies in those countries. And you can see that in Argentina and Brazil, for example, poverty has gone down. The impact on poverty has been reverted because of those policies, may have been reverted, I should say, because of course these are simulation. And the inequality, if we look at the case of Brazil, has uh, uh, gone down rather than gone up. As a matter of fact, when we look at the solid line, it is difficult to say because we see that uh, both the very bottom part of the distribution and the top part of the distribution were less uh, hit by, uh, less affected by the uh, uh, crisis than, than, than the others. So this, uh, I think, is an interesting uh, um, conclusion. Finally, uh, if we look at a few uh, ad hoc panels surveys which are available, we have something which is quite interesting. The Come Here uh, survey has been a survey which, uh, for any other reasons, started in January 2020, and then was taken in May again, and in September again. Same people, it is a panel survey. Five countries, 1,600 individuals in every country, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Sweden. And this is, on average, for all those, if we put the five samples together, for the whole sample, for the uh, 8,000 uh, 8, people, what we find is this evolution. Inequality increased in May, just after the uh, lockdown, or just at the middle of the lockdown in many countries. So definitely the lockdown had an inequality impact on the distribution. But by September, okay, this is telling me that I should stop very, very shortly. Uh, but in uh, September, uh, inequality had gone down simply because compensating policies uh, came uh, out and uh, uh, made uh, equalized the distribution at that time. I must say that I'm a bit surprised by that, that the inequality went down, but uh, uh, probably we'll have to, 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 to work more on this. But uh, this basically says that uh, the impact is not as, things are not as simple as one uh, could think uh, of. And also I want to mention a study on Bangladesh by uh, uh, Sim Rehan and the uh, colleagues. They re-interviewed uh, people who had been interviewed uh, in, by their uh, research center in 2018. Uh, they only were able to get 5,000 households. So there was a attrition of the initial panel, but by 37%, but you had still more than 50% uh, being, people being re-interviewed. And what they found in that case is a surge in poverty, of course, this is uh, what uh, we, we know, but uh, they observe a noticeable increase in inequality. Uh, more or less everybody was very much affected, even the top decides were very much affected by the lockdown, less uh, a 30% drop in uh, uh, consumption expenditures, but uh, the top was less affected definitely than the bottom. So definitely there was there an increase in inequality, and this was taking into account, of course, the compensating policies. Now, uh, a few words about, because I'm uh, in a hurry, let me go directly to what we can say about the COVID crisis and global income inequality. So I'll go directly to those charts, which uh, uh, I have uh, uh, done, I mean, uh, which based on calculation, which I have done for this presentation. What I've done here is that simply I looked, I took some uh, previous uh, estimates of the evolution of the global inequality that uh, I have worked on for many time. I had uh, this book uh, several years ago, which was uh, 
basically uh, about, about, which was partly about this. And I tried to figure out what would be the impact of the crisis by using the GDP per capita uh, 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 forecast by uh, uh, the IMF, uh, some of them from January, some other from last October, and trying to see, okay, what has been the impact and what has been the evolution of inequality? Uh, if we simply say that uh, we, we take those figures of GDP per capita growth, we apply them to the data that we had for uh, 2018, 19, et cetera, and then we see what is the resulting distribution of income within the world. This is taking into account both inequality between countries and inequality within countries, except for the fact that because I didn't have any data to do that, I kept the inequality within country constant. And uh, uh, so there is something missing here. Uh, we are basically looking at only the impact of the between inequality change on the global inequality among all the world citizens. Uh, 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 but uh, something is missing because we don't have the change in within country inequality yet. And what you can see in the circles is the uh, evolution. We see that the uh, trend that the downward trend that we have in inequality is essentially flattening uh, in uh, 2019, 2020. And uh, if instead of comparing to the previous year, we compare to what would have been the implications of continuing the growth trends observed in every country in the world uh, from uh, 29 to 2020, then this is a dotted line and you see that the actual change in inequality is the difference between what, may, what we may observe, which is the solid line, and what we could have observed if growth had remained the same in all countries. And we see there that definitely there has been an increase in inequality with respect to uh, this uh, uh, counterfactual uh, about the growth trend, but inequality basically uh, uh, remained constant, uh, didn't increase, remain constant uh, if we uh, uh, look at the comparison between 2019 and 2020. This is more or less in agreement with some results that Angus Deaton got uh, doing the same kind of exercise lately. He find more or less the same uh, thing. The only thing that is uh, uh, measuring the impact of the crisis by looking at the difference between the forecast by the IMF of uh, uh, growth in 2020 as uh, uh, released in uh, uh, January uh, to the forecast which were made a year ago before the pandemic. And then he says the difference in the forecast is telling us something about what has been the impact of the pandemic. But he finds basically something very similar to uh, what uh, we have here. Okay, so uh, let me uh, conclude very quickly. Uh, and this is the last point. What is the likely legacy on uh, the, uh, of the crisis? And uh, uh, the reason why I believe that maybe we are going toward a reversal of this downward global inequality trend that you have just seen on the previous uh, uh, chart. The uh, legacy effect include the consequences of a severe increase in poverty in many countries uh, uh, of the world and especially in the South, of course. The loss of human capital uh, uh, due to the uh, increase in poverty and the fact that uh, there were some health uh, problems or the health of the population certainly has been affected by the increase in poverty. Loss of human capital through the interruption of uh, schools. Huge, a huge increase in dropouts in many uh, uh, countries. And we know that many people who have not gone to school for uh, six months probably will never go back to school. So we truly have dropouts and the impact of that will be felt for a very long time. And finally, the increase in the indebtedness of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We knew this was already a big issue before the pandemic. Now those countries have had to borrow a little more uh, during the uh, pandemic, during 2020. And uh, the uh, increases of the uh, debt has been more or less 10% of GDP. And this means that uh, one way or another, this debt is not sustainable. Something will have to be done, but most likely some, uh, the growth will slow down in those countries because there will be some uh, package, some changes in uh, uh, policy. Uh, 
that will be producing that uh, change. So all these factors uh, will probably produce a slowdown in the growth of those countries. And because of that, it may be the case that for at least a couple of years, the global trend that we have seen uh, uh, for the equalizing of the global income distribution might stop and we might go toward a, a reversal and toward an increase in global inequality because the poorest country in the world will be uh, uh, affected for some uh, uh, time for uh, the, some durability in the affection, I mean, in the way in which those countries will be affected. And uh, uh, this is uh, something which I uh, believe we must be prepared. And because of that, uh, the main uh, conclusion that I would uh, get from all this would be to say that the help that uh, uh, should come from, the, that uh, the help has to come from the global development community, especially in terms of the debt, something has to be done. It is not clear what, uh, uh, what can be done. And the situation is slightly more complicated than in the 90s, in the late 90s, at the time of the uh, HIPIC uh, initiative, with, uh, which reduced the debt of uh, uh, low-income countries. Uh, so what uh, the G7 or the G20 can do is something really quite important. We have to go beyond simply a uh, uh, stopping or uh, a moratorium on the debt service. We need really to get uh, uh, to reduce the debt, and this will take uh, some time, as we as we know. The other thing on which we need to have uh, a community aid coming from the development community is, of course, about vaccination. And I will finish on this. As I said at the beginning, we don't know what will happen with the pandemic, in, in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. It may be the case that, and uh, we have some signs today that the situation is worsening in several countries. Uh, because of that, it is very urgent for vaccination to become available in those countries. And we know that today, those countries will have to, would have to wait uh, one year before really some significant vaccination program would start. So what could be done about uh, this? Uh, this is something that was completely ignored until now. Uh, and I think that uh, this should become a priority in uh, the uh, global uh, dialogue about the uh, development that uh, will take place in the coming uh, weeks, I think so. And I will stop here. I've been a bit yeah. sorry about this. Uh, Francis, thank you so much. It's a really interesting uh, presentation. I mean, there are several uh, interesting po uh, uh, points that I thought came across, which we'll follow up in the Q&A. One was the spatial and temporal dimensions of the pandemic. Uh, that's very important. The second was, I thought, really interesting, the U-shaped effect of the pandemic and cash transfers in Latin America, which is something somewhat counterintuitive. And the question is, do we see that in other parts of the, of the developing world? And of course, the implications of global inequality. Uh, I'm going to now ask Martha Roy to, to make her comments on, on your presentation, also her thoughts on exactly questions of implications of the pandemic on global inequality. Martha, over to you. Thanks very much, Kunal, and thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor. I'm giving myself a timer, and I'm going to try to, try to stick to 10 minutes or less. Let's see if I get to it. Uh, let me share my screen. OK, so um, on the policy implications, Francois has said that, um, that the uh, pandemic exposes uh, existing inequalities and can make them worse. Um, so the question is, what can we do about it? Um, from our point of view here at the, the UN Secretariat, we have presented this crisis as a tipping point, as a, a fork in the road, a moment where the, uh, the, the inequalities may be too large to be ignored uh, and something has to be done about it. Uh, so what are the implications for policy? And here I want to distinguish two different um, types of implications. Uh, I can't, I seem to have trouble moving my presentation. Can you see the next slide? Yes, it's, uh, okay. it is fine, Martin. Yeah, go ahead. Perfect. I'm sorry. So um, within country inequality, from where we stand, we, I would say, and this is my opinion, there's reason for hope. There seems to be more awareness uh, among member states and uh, more willingness to go for bold policy options than there was in the past, say after the 2008 crisis. 
the reason for hope also in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the rescue packages that have been put in place, larger also than in 2008, and with uh, a significant amount of discretionary spending on social protection, as Francois has shown, um, many of these, uh, those um, uh, rescue packages based on preliminary evidence may have been able to um, arrest the growing inequality trend. Um, so reason for hope when it comes to addressing um, um, within country inequalities, at least in terms of the commitment that governments are, sh are showing. Uh, inequality being between countries, that's more uncertain because obviously countries are plagued with um, domestic problems and when countries have uh, plagued with domestic problems, they are less likely to, uh, to show solidarity across their borders. Um, there are some, there are some uh, shows of solidarity there, there are debt relief measures, very, very short, very focused uh, in terms of uh, letting countries, making sure that countries are able to implement their emergency rescue uh, packages, but very, very short lived and very, um, not very ambitious. There are also um, efforts to coordinate the vaccine, you know, make sure that the vaccine is available to all countries, but then again, you know, including COVAX, for example. But then again, what we are seeing is the, uh, there's is almost a perfect correlation between GDP and the availability of vaccine and the speed of the vaccine rollout. So for now, the reason we, we don't see that, that anything is changing in terms of addressing inequality between, between countries. When it comes to inequality within countries, um, there's increasing commitment, but what, do, what happens after the rescue packages are withdrawn. Of course, rescue packages are short-term measures, one-off measures, and there's a risk that once again, they will be withdrawn too soon. There is increasing number of voices are calling already for a move to fiscal austerity as soon as possible. Um, what happens after these packages are withdrawn? And here I want to just give a very, very basic message that we have repeating for many years, but I think it's worth repeating, is that policies matter. Uh, all too often, the discourse on inequalities is rather fatalistic in the sense that growing inequalities are presented as an inexorable trend that results say, from technological innovation or global um, uh, integration, or in this case, the pandemic, as if nothing could be done about them. But it is clear that something can be done about it. Uh, inequalities, the both levels and even trends of inequality are very different among countries, even within the same region, even at the same development level, even equally exposed to trade. So there's something one can do to arrest the growing trends of inequality. This is the first point I want to make. And policies matter for good and for bad. Um, within the last decades, for example, many policies have been actually counterproductive when it comes to uh, arresting the increasing inequality trend or have just done nothing to arrest it. Let me give you some examples. One is that redistribution, taxes and transfers ha have failed to, co to curve the, the trend to, towards growing inequality. This graph presents a very rough indicator of, of uh, redistribution, which is the difference between the Gini coefficient of market income shown in orange and the Gini coefficient of disposable income. Again, a very rough measure, measure of redistribution. There are better analyses. Um, Francois mentioned Noralustic. The Commitment for Equity Initiative has better analysis. But in any case, this rough indicator shows that it's not that policies have become less redistributive. Although in some cases, yes, the tax system has become less progressive over the last decades. But it's just that they have not become increasingly redistributive as inequality in market income has grown. So that's an example of a policy that has not helped. There are others. Um, the cost of basic services, for example, on average uh, has increased in healthcare, access to healthcare, the cost of education, the cost of housing as well. And this of course affects families that are poorer. Uh, the, uh, there's growing insecurity, that's very important. There's growing security and precariousness in the world of work. Changes in the world of work have um, actually pushed inequality upwards as well. And more importantly, there's a growing disconnect between labor market policies in, in institutions and the changes that are taking place in the world of work. 
in the sense that we have increasing precariousness. We have a growing number of people working under non-standard contracts, meaning temporary contracts, zero hour, hour contracts, uh, including in the growing gig economy. We have persistent informality in developing countries, and yet we have labor market policies and institutions and even social protection systems that are still um, designed to, for, for um, labor markets where most of the working population is in the formal sector and working under standard contracts. Um, for example, many social protection programs are still tied to a contract with specific employer. Other social protection programs, uh, social insurance programs specifically, are tied to uh, salaried employment. Many are not portable between different jobs. Many are not portable across countries. So we, there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect. And this disconnect, we argue, together with growing inequalities, has very negative impacts, very obvious impacts, including on uh, deaths from COVID-19 that could, could have been prevented, but it has also negative uh, political impacts. I'm just looking at the time. Do I still have a couple of minutes? Yes. Two minutes, Marta, is that okay? Yes, okay, that's fine. So. Uh, let me focus for a second on the political, on the negative political impacts of, of uh, growing inequalities and the disconnect between policies and the reality of today's world of work and beyond. An important uh, impact is declining trust in institutions, increasing discontent among the population. Here I'm just showing the, uh, the example of the United States where trust in government, people who trust governments highly, has declined from the 19, late 1950s to 2017, which is when we have the last um, data from the Pew Research Center from 70% to 20%. And this is also the case, perhaps not as steeply, but it's also the case in many other developed countries and trust remains low in developing countries. This is a consequence of inequalities, but it also poses uh, an obstacle to addressing inequalities because uh, it disenfranchises part of the population. It, creates disengagement with public mandates. It makes it therefore harder to, to, to implement public mandates to, to make those investments that would help address inequalities in the, same, in the first place. So it creates a vicious cycle and it weakens the social contract. It is in this context that the Secretary General uh, in a speech that he gave uh, last summer uh, talked of a new social contract for an, a new area. His speech was aspirational, and then so he gave a list of policy outcomes of a possible new social contract. Um, I'm not. I'm just gonna not going to go through them because I think we all know um, what these policies are. Some have to do with uh, promoting equal opportunity, access to quality education, healthcare, and so on. Others have to do with ensuring equal rights, tackling prejudice and discrimination. There's also some space for redistribution. Um, and all these policies, of course, are linked to each other. Uh, promoting equal opportunity is important, but one needs tax revenue in order to promote equal opportunity. Um, um, the issue with policies to reduce inequality is not so much that we don't know what needs to be done, that there's not technical advice to know what has worked and what has not worked in different uh, country contexts, or even that there's not enough capacity, administrative capacity to implement some of these policies, is that there are important obstacles to implementing some of these policies. And I think it's important to understand what the obstacles are in order to be able to mobilize support for these policies. Uh, very quickly, challenges to many of these policies. One has been with us for a long time is that many redistributive uh, efforts face opposition for, by very powerful sectors of society. This is not new, again. What's perhaps new is that we have the class coalitions of the past, the class coalitions that supported strong redistributive agendas are, do no longer exist. The industrial era working class that supported big new deals in now developed countries doesn't exist and the middle class is shrinking. So we have a change in coalitions right now. We have part of the working class that feels excluded, that objectively is excluded, but also feels excluded. And that is important because part of this working class is providing support to fringe political movements that do not necessarily support redistribution. So again, this is not to end on a pessimistic note, but just to say that it's important to understand the obstacles we, the obstacles we face, 
that may weaken the social contract as well in order to uh, think of what to do and how to convince government and their constituencies that addressing inequality right now is important. I don't have time. I was going to say that the Secretary General also talked about a new global deal. Um, the need to strengthen multilateralism. Is, uh, COVID may be a moment where we succeed in reinforcing global solidarity. I was going to speak about uh, tax cooperation and a reform of the debt architecture, but maybe we can talk about this during the discussion. So, th thanks so much, Kunal. And I'm sorry. Marta, thanks so much. Yeah. Now, I think what I, what I think is so important what you said was that even before the pandemic hit, we were not doing very well on, on SDG 10, on inequality, right? And the pandemic has actually brought into sharper focus our failures in addressing inequality even prior to the pandemic. So I think that's a, uh, it's a very important point. And the question of a new social contract is obviously something that one needs to think about. Now, I have several questions in the Q&A that I can see. Let me ask uh, the first three I can see here are questions from Carlos Gradin, Ricardo Santos, and a very interesting question from Marcus Exer. Uh, all three of you, I've unmuted you. So what I suggest is if you can take this three this set of questions uh, all together and please be focused and be uh, to the point. So Carlos, do you want to go ahead? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kunal, and thank you, Francois and Marta, for the presentation. I, I was uh, thinking about if you have any reflections on the impact of the pandemic on horizontal inequalities. And I think in, uh, mostly in terms of age, so the pandemic clearly has affected uh, mostly the elderly, especially those uh, living in nursing homes, which at the same time could be uh, aggravated by the failure, the policy failure, no, in managing the crisis in these institutions, uh, but also thinking in terms of the impact on ethnic minorities in some countries, for example, in the U.S. or uh, immigrants, temporary workers, etc. Thank you very much. Thanks. So I think. Otto, you had two questions. Do you want to go ahead? Keep yes, I'll try to be quick. Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> So, um, first of all, uh, thank you so much um, for the presentations and um, Francois, it's a pleasure to, to talk with you again uh, from Mozambique. Um, so, I, I would see in your presentation that, like, it's an excellent presentation, I would see some possible caveats, uh, in particular on the possibly muddle the waters on global inequality effects of COVID. So, for one, on the incidence of COVID, so if poorer countries are younger, i.e. A, a higher percentage of the population are of ages with lower COVID morbidity, COVID, COVID incidence may be lower than average Chetris Paribus. But then the elderly in those poorer countries may be relatively worse off than elderly in richer countries. Uh, and when we look on impacts of lockdown, again, if, if poorer countries are more rural, i.e. a higher percentage of percentage of population lives in rural areas and rural areas are more sparsely populated and this is necessarily not the rule in all global south countries um, then lockdown effects might have been mitigated again all other things considered but the urban residents in poorer countries that implemented lockdown may have suffered more and may have be, had lower access to social compensation measures than urban dwellers from richer countries. And then on vaccination, one could arguably suggest that uh, countries with a younger and mostly rural population, again, if sparse, may manage to normally overcome COVID with a lower rate of vaccination. But what can be the medium and long-term effects of an effective effort to reach uh, herd immunity in the global north and the ineffective effect of reaching the same uh, type of immunity in the global south. I acknowledge that this last question is probably a, more suited for epidemiologists than for us economists, but uh, they would probably, there would be probably an impact on social economic inequality nonetheless. Over. Thanks, thanks Ricardo. Uh, Marcus Hexer, are you on, online? Do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much uh, for the enlightening presentations. Uh, Professor Bourguignon, I have seen uh, Professors Ditton and Milanovic explaining that Chinese stronger growth rate inverted its impact on global inequality. Now, 
China is rich enough to increase global inequality when it grows more than everyone else. Does your final result come from that too? Thanks, Marcus. I'm going to uh, have one more question coming in, if that's okay, uh, fr uh, Francois and, and Marta, and then you can do these questions. Uh, Giovanni Valencisi, do you want to ask your question? I've, I've unmuted you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, and thanks for the excellent presentation. Uh, my question just uh, wanted to point to uh, one of the issues on how much do you think that the evolution of functional inequality matters in determining the long-term trends that were presented, especially within country? And then uh, related to this, uh, to what extent do you think that COVID could affect also the functional inequality, particularly if we consider the weakening bargaining power of workers and the strengthening bargaining power of certain lead uh, firms, especially in the digital world, that continue to grow and record increasing profits despite the crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, Francois and Marta, do you want to uh, perhaps Francois to start with and Marta respond to the, say, some very, very interesting questions? Francois, would you want to start? Okay, thank you very much for, for the questions and uh, uh, thanks, Marta, for your, uh, your comments. I mean, uh, uh, listening to you, uh, many ideas came to my mind, but I'm afraid that uh, we won't have time to, to go uh, over uh, all of them. But let me start first with uh, uh, the question that we just uh, heard. Uh, on the Carlos about horizontal inequality, um, I'm afraid that we, again, I mean, in terms of uh, economic inequality, uh, we don't know very much. I mean, we know about uh, health or let's say the uh, mortality due to COVID. We know that they're very well, that uh, uh, there is a big difference in terms of ethnicity, uh, uh, in terms of age, of course. Uh, this is uh, the, one of the characteristics of this pandemic is to affect uh, uh, older people. Uh, but uh, for the impact of the lockdown, it's uh, not, not completely clear. I believe that uh, uh, one thing is sure, it is a fact that uh, in terms of age, the issue is not so much uh, uh, older people versus uh, the rest of the population. It is about younger people and the rest of the population. The people who have been, who have been most affected in uh, uh, <clears throat> developed countries has been the young people precisely because they were uh, somewhat part of the informal sector. All those people were working in order to survive, in order to pay for their uh, studies. We're working in uh, restaurants, in bars, having this kind of uh, informal uh, part-time job. Suddenly, because of the lockdown, they don't have anything to rely on. And uh, the situation for many of those people has been really dramatic. Moreover, the uh, uh, rescue package, uh, which went through the official channels of uh, uh, redistribution policies, uh, very often uh, could not reach those people because they were not in those official channels. So for all these reasons, I would say that in terms of horizontal inequality, the young people have been the most, uh, most affected in, uh, in many countries. And uh, because uh, ethnicity is also discriminating, uh, I mean, because uh, ethnic people uh, or I think young people tend to be also in the informal sector, more or less in all countries, I would say that there is also an impact on this. On the uh, question by uh, Ricardo about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that we should take into account when talking, when uh, uh, referring to uh, developing countries, so that the fact that uh, the rural area, the rural sector is more important, that, that's true. Uh, because of that, uh, uh, you have a more dispersed population because of this uh, virus may not have been as, uh, uh, the impact has not been as severe as it could have been. This is uh, true. Uh, in terms of the lockdown, remember that uh, in many countries, we, uh, uh, we saw a reverse migration process. And the reverse migration process has affected rural areas because basically, look at what happened in India, for example. Uh, very, long, very soon after the, uh, they uh, decided about the lockdown, many people left 
the big cities to go back to the villages. But this means that in the villages, you had many more people to share what uh, was available in those villages. So those people have also been affected. Uh, but it was a consequence of the lockdown in the cities. And uh, uh, this is a, a phenomenon which I believe has been quite important in a few countries, but which we are not able to analyze very well. Moreover, because and it's not sure that in the future we'll be able to do that, basically because uh, the uh, information on this uh, temporary reverse migration might not be uh, available. I think it is an important uh, point to, to, to take into account. And what you told about uh, the fact that in the future, uh, things may not be that bad in those countries, things may depend very, very much on the mutation of the, vir of the virus. We know that some variants are much more uh, aggressive than others. And in particular, the, these days, the uh, concern about uh, many uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa is precisely the fact that there seems to be a, uh, an increase in the aggressivity of uh, the virus due to the fact that the variant is uh, completely different. And uh, if this is the case, then uh, the problem may be very serious in the, in, in the future and vaccination may become a very important uh, uh, need in, uh, in the future. Remember also, that uh, uh, the new variants seem to be less discriminatory with respect to age. So your point about uh, less uh, uh, people are younger in developing countries, which is absolutely correct, may not be uh, as uh, important uh, anymore in the future if the variants are uh, attacking or are uh, being uh, are hitting much more severely uh, people at uh, middle in middle age uh, uh, at, at middle age in uh, uh, about uh, Marcos uh, point about uh, uh, China uh, I was uh, as a matter of fact uh, I am the one <laughs> who suggested to Angus Deaton that uh, he should look at China and uh, uh, probably uh, because in initial version, he said, uh, China has contributed to equalize the distribution. And I told him, look, the problem today is that China has been reaching a level which is above the median uh, uh, in the global distribution. And because of that, uh, China's growth is today contributing more to inequality than to equality, which it did for uh, many decades uh, before. Uh, so, uh, but in uh, with my data, I find the same thing as uh, uh, Deaton and uh, Milanovic. Uh, basically, what, what is more interesting is the fact that uh, Deaton, uh, I've not seen what uh, uh, Branko Milanovic has done, but uh, Deaton is using the, as a measure of inequality, the standard deviation of logarithm. When I'm using the standard deviation of logarithm, I find the same result as he did. If I'm using the Gini coefficient or the tile coefficient or other, I don't find this uh, 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 this change, this uh, specific effect due to China. This suggests that uh, uh, if we were to look at Lorentz curves of uh, those distribution, most likely it cannot be said that the Lorentz curve is shifting up uh, outward or shifting inward. This means that the Lorentz curve is crossing are crossing each other, uh, and the different inequality measures will uh, uh, give different uh, 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 res responses to the question of increasing or decreasing inequality. And finally, about the functional distribution, uh, you're right that uh, uh, in the past, uh, the evolution of functional uh, distribution in uh, many uh, uh, countries uh, has been in favor of capital and this uh, contributed to more inequality. Now, we have to remember that there is a big difference between market income inequality, where the functional income distribution plays a direct role, and the inequality of disposable income or the inequality of equivalized disposable household income when we take into account the redistribution system. When you look at developed countries today, and it is more or less a, a kind of a, a picture that Marta has shown, and you see that the increase in inequality of uh, uh, income after uh, all the redistribution, taxes and benefits has not been that, that big. And as a matter of fact, we know when we look at averages that the increase is due to, to a very reduced number of countries, in particular, the US. 
but in most European countries, for example, uh, the uh, distribution of disposable, uh, equivalent disposable income has practically not changed. So this uh, issue of the functional distribution is important when we look at market income and uh, in other words, when we ignore the impact of redistribution. Now at the global level, uh, I'm not clear about this. And is it possible to say something about the COVID? Uh, I'm not sure about this. It is too early. Now, this is the last remark I want to make. And uh, uh, I must say that uh, listening to Marta, this uh, came to my mind. There is something which I completely uh, ignored in my presentation. And, and this is really a big problem. So I apologize for that. When talking about the legacy of the crisis, we should first look at what will be the exit of the crisis? What will be the exit of the lockdown situation in which we still have many, uh, we still find many countries or at least curfew uh, or this kind of measures which have been taken? What will happen when in those countries the rescue package will progressively be dismantled. And this is where the issue will really start. This is when we will see problems in the labor market. This is when we will see unemployment going up. This is when we will see firms which have been able to stay alive during the crisis because they were supported by the uh, uh, policies, state policies. Uh, suddenly those firms will go bankrupt. This is true both in uh, developing as in developed countries. So the big issue from my point of view will be precisely then. Uh, maybe it will be uh, at the end of this year, 2021, maybe it will be at the beginning of uh, 2022, but uh, probably the big impact of the crisis will be at that moment. And then my uh, gut feeling and my almost my conviction is that uh, then inequality will definitely be increasing within uh, countries. Uh, because uh, it would be very surprising that uh, the redistribution of the uh, policies which have been put in place during the COVID might be maintained as such for a very long time. I mean, the cost, their cost is really enormous. And at some stage, uh, uh, there will be an issue with the indebtedness of uh, those countries. So uh, this is something which is missing in my presentation. Again, I apologize for that because this is certainly a very, very important point for what will happen within countries and what will happen at the global level. And I stop uh, here. Uh, Francis, thank you so much. I think that's a really important point that we still don't know yet what the impact of the pandemic will be when the state starts withdrawing support that they have provided to, to workers. So that's something we'll have to see in the next year or so. Uh, I want, uh, Marta, I wanted to ask you, do you want to respond particularly in the question on, the, on horizontal inequality and also on weakening bargaining power workers? Horizontal inequality, because I know that you and your division have been working on this issue for quite some time. And on the weakening bargaining power of workers, I think this is linked to the question that you raised about the new the social contract. You want to uh, go ahead? Sure. So on the uh, horizontal inequalities, uh, I don't know. I can't I can say better than Francois if they are going to increase or not. But policy-wise, what matters is what, what the cause of these different impacts of the cry of the of, of COVID on say different racial groups, what the cause is. I more in the informal sector because of uh, low income, because of lower access to uh, better education, uh, the digital divide and so on, or are they more affected because of discrimination? Too often in the press, there seems to be an assumption that any um, racial differences in the impact of the crisis are due to discrimination. It's not so sure. I haven't seen any studies that control for everything else, for the socioeconomic status of these racial minorities before making um, uh, assumptions. But the policy implications are very different depending on, on the root of these differences between ethnic groups, for example. Um, on the uh, ju just one thing though, on the um, th there there was the question on vaccination and and global integration and what happens if you know populations are, that are younger and more rural um, reach herd immunity without necessarily being vaccinated in the south. One issue that may be affected is obviously international migration. If having been vaccinated becomes a condition for traveling internationally, then we have we are going back in time many, many years, many people will not be allowed to migrate or even travel anymore. That's a good point, very good point. So, so that's, that's something that may stay uh, with us. Um, 
of the, the issue of the new social contract is, is, is complex, but that I think is precisely why the Secretary General put on the table the need for a new social contract, precisely because the different stakeholders don't have the same power that they had 50 years ago anymore because workers don't have the same power, don't have a voice because uh, you know they are not unionized and unions are not fit for today's challenges. So uh, that's what was on the table. How, how, how do we give these new these workers that have lost their voice a voice again? And that may help also regain trust in governments and so on. Um, I, I don't have an answer, but I think it's, it's in everyone's interest that uh, that people who have lost their voice be given a voice. And I'm not answering the question here. I think it would be a much longer discussion, but just, you know, some reflections. Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks to Francois. Uh, we are already six minutes past the hour, so I'm going to bring this webinar to a close. We had some really great questions and very interesting presentations. Um, just want to remind those who are watching this webinar that the next webinar will be on the 23rd of March. And that will be looking at the effect of the pandemic on a specific set of workers, garment workers in a particular country context, Bangladesh. So if you can find further details about this webinar, the next webinar on our website. Thanks so much, Marta. Thanks so much, Francois. It was a really interesting. And I think the question, I think the way to think about this now is that we need to get better data, really, to have a better on the sense of what has happened to inequality, both within country and across countries. That we we'll, may have to wait for a little bit longer because that's not gonna happen. The data will not arrive right away. But I think it's important to get a better sense of what's happening because at this point, it's still not very obvious, especially on across, across country inequality as, as you mentioned. So that's gonna be really interesting to see exactly what we see from the data when we, when we start getting it in the next few months. Thank you so much. And thanks for everyone for listening in and thanks for the great questions. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.